Hello, I'm Andrew Holmes, and I'm going to uh, be the one torturing you as we work through the equity material here at Level 1. So uh, if, you, uh, if you are new to the program, new to the capital markets, I think you'll find uh, this to be uh, uh, really valuable information. And if you've been an equity trader or something for a long time, then uh, this will be a good review. So let's just dive right in. We're going to start off with this uh, reading on market organization and structure. And uh, this is a lot of vocabulary, terminology type stuff, as well as, uh, I guess, a few principles that we need to uh, make sure that everybody's on top of. Uh, as we progress through and work towards equity valuation. So we're, what we're working within here is the financial system, right? So the, and the financial system is basically this process that uh, uh, allocates capital in, uh, in an economy. So the, the, the biggest function here is to allocate capital efficiency. Uh, efficiently, that means that capital is going to flow to its highest and best use. Why is that? Because uh, the people who can do the most with it can pay the most for it. So uh, the, the overall system is going to function uh, in order to allocate capital efficiently, which is, means we're going to maximize profit and we're hoping that that's going to maximize output as well. So uh, we're, but in a more uh, sort of nuts and bolts perspective, what it allows the individual entities people, banks, uh, you know, any player in the market to do is to uh, do things like borrow capital, save, you know, issue equity, manage risks. So if you have risk that you're worried about, you can manage that, put it off to somebody else, uh, find an offsetting con contract, exchange assets, utilize information, those types of things. And uh, this uh, capital efficiency thing is basically what it's uh, going to do in the end is it's going to equate savings and borrowing in an economy. So if you've uh, taken a a macroeconomic class uh, or class in macroeconomics, then uh, you have uh, my uh, sympathies. But nonetheless, uh, when you strip everything away, what you get down to is uh, S is equal to I, right? Uh, so savings is equal to investment. So here we're going to have, uh, we're going to equate uh, the savings and borrowing or savings and investment in the economy through the financial system. So a couple of different players here. An investor, so uh, this is someone who, uh, you know, is investing their money. They're not, they're, their mission in life is not to be financial analysts. They're not looking for, you know, the uh, high return, low risk uh, security that people waste their lives in search of. Uh, they're just trying to earn a fair return. So if you uh, have a 401k, you're putting, uh, you know, $500 a month into that, then you're an investor. So you've picked, uh, you have an asset allocation, you understand the variability of that, and you're looking for equilibrium fair returns. You can contrast that with an information trader. So an information trader is someone who thinks they know something. Uh, not, that doesn't mean inside information, right? But this is an active management strategy. It is something that says, look, I am a superior analyst or I have better information and uh, I, I'm expecting to earn something more than uh, the fair or equilibrium return. I want to have a positive risk-adjusted return. So I want to be able to allocate this capital and add value. Right? And then a hedger, this is someone who has a position uh, from something else. It could be something else in the financial system, but somewhere out there they have some risk. They don't want to carry that risk going forward, so they're looking for a way to offset that. And uh, so we're going to, maybe it's interest rate risk. Uh, I get hurt if interest rates go up, so they're looking for a way to um, uh, to offset this interest rate exposure. Maybe there's someone else in the economy who gets hurt if interest rates go down. So those two would be natural trading partners in a derivatives contract or something along those lines. So the classification of assets. So we have financial versus real assets. So financial, this is going to be stocks and bonds and uh, contracts and those types of things. Real assets in this context will be, uh, of course, real estate as well as, you know, uh, machines and uh, railroad rolling stock and 747s and that type of stuff. So debt versus equity. Uh, equity is uh, another way of saying the ownership of a company. So if you start a snow cone stand, you borrow $5,000 from the bank and you put up $5,000 of your own money, well, you are the equity in that business, so you're the owner. And then the bank is the debt holder. They're the ones that are loaning money against uh, the assets of the firm. So uh, debt is going to be looking typically, and there's a lot of different kinds of debt out there, but debt looks for a fixed return or will have a maximum return. Equity can be, of course, much, much uh, greater, have much greater returns, but it also has a greater risk associated with it. So public versus private securities. So public, these are publicly traded. Uh, they get uh, reported on the news every night. You can see the little ticker running up across the bottom of your television uh, or those, those types of things. There's also private securities. That means it's 
not publicly traded. So just it's an equity in the, a share of equity in the company. I own it, but uh, it's not publicly traded. That would be private. And then uh, physical derivatives versus financial derivatives. Financial derivatives is where we're trading derivatives contracts. That means a contract where the outcome is based on something else. So where deri a derivative derives its value from something else in the economy, could be the price of wheat, could be changes in interest rates, all those types of things. So a financial derivative uh, is um, uh, one that deals with financial products. So interest rates, stocks, bonds, those types of things. A physical derivative is one that is uh, dealing with wheat or pork bellies or something like that. So physical versus financial derivatives, different asset classifications there. A few more, uh, so I guess classifications of markets. So spot markets versus futures markets. And we could also call this spot versus forward. So uh, remember that uh, forward and futures are essentially the same thing. Forwards, forward markets and futures markets. Futures are exchanges and forwards are over the counter. But uh, you can use, uh, you, I think you can use, think of those interchangeably, at least uh, as you're getting started. So spot markets, that's also sometimes called the cash market. Okay, and that means that it's the market for immediate delivery. So if you want to buy a bond and you buy it in the spot market, uh, then you're going to give them the money and you're going to get the bond, right? The immediate delivery. As opposed to a forward or futures market, that's where we agree to buy or agree to sell in the future at a price we determine today, but we execute later. So a forward or futures contract is a contract for delayed delivery. Okay, primary versus secondary markets. Primary is where we initially issue securities. So you uh, hear about companies going public. That means they're taking their equity and they're selling it to the general public. Uh, and uh, you can buy shares and be an owner in that company uh, uh, versus a secondary market. Well, with a primary market, that's the initial sell. So think of maybe, I don't know, it's been a while, but Facebook's IPO, right? So uh, when Facebook went public, they sold a bunch, a bunch of shares of stock uh, that were way overpriced. Anyway, uh, but nonetheless, um, uh, who got the money? Well, the money in a primary transaction goes to the issuer, less the Ferraris we have to buy for the investment bankers and those types of things, but the money comes back to the issuer. In a secondary market, that's a trade between investors. So Facebook sells each share one time, then it's sold, and then uh, you and I can trade it uh, back and forth as many times as we, we want, theoretically, for the rest of eternity. Okay, so uh, call versus continuous markets. We'll see a little more on this later, but a call market trades at specific points in time. A continuous market is one that you can trade in any time the market is open. Money versus capital markets. So a money market is uh, typically... F uh, when we say money markets, we mean uh, uh, securities that have a maturity of less than one year. So a 30-day T-bill or a nine-month T-bill uh, would be a money market instrument. A capital market are those things that are, have a maturity of greater than one year. So all equity securities plus longer-term bonds, that type of stuff would be capital market securities. So traditional versus alternative. So traditional, uh, traditional markets are for traditional securities. That would be uh, you know, investment-grade bonds, uh, you know, uh, highly liquid equity securities, uh, that type of thing, as opposed to alternative investments, which has been a growing category of, uh, of uh, uh, asset al in asset allocation over the last 15 or 20 years. But these would be anything that is not traditional. So uh, the typical alternative assets would be things like, uh, you know, investments in real estate, uh, maybe private equity funds or he some hedge funds would fall into this category. Uh, I guess those would be the prime examples, okay? but it could also be, you know, precious metals or artwork or, you know, those types of things. So alternatives are going to be things that are not the traditional stock bond type stuff that you would see as the core of an institutional portfolio. Types of assets here. So equities. So we've already talked a little bit about this. Uh, equity securities. These are ownership in a company. So uh, you remember we've talked about uh, you're looking at the balance sheet of the company. You have assets on one side, and that's got to be equal to liabilities plus equity on the other. Well, of course, the accounting uh, function makes all this historical cost stuff you know, overlays and that kind of messes it up. Okay, but uh, these are the people that own the company, right? So this, represented, uh, this represents the investment by the equity holders of the firm. Uh, and if we could do all this at market value, if we could state assets and liabilities at market value, then the, we would also have, by definition, equity stated at market value under those circumstances. But this is, uh, this is what we call stocks or the stock market, right? So you refer to... I guess uh, I, if you don't want to talk about the stock market, you talk about equities. And I don't know, maybe that makes you sound more sophisticated or something. So anyway, so uh, the equities, this is just ownership in a firm, right? Or in a 
in an, as in an equity stake is an ownership stake in uh, an asset or a group of assets. So fixed income securities, that's uh, what we more, the more common terminology for that is bonds. So this is where you've got a contract that says I'm going to make payments uh, according to this uh, guideline and at the end of uh, the maturity of this instrument I'm going to return the principal. So fixed incomes uh, are you know, stocks and bonds are the ter first two things here. Pooled instruments, this is where we're going to take lots of assets and put them together in a bucket and then we're going to sell an undivided interest against those. So a mutual fund, if you are uh, currently an equity investor then this is, might be the way that you would uh, 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 access the the markets you would instead of instead of going out and buying you know a half a share of Apple and two shares of IBM and something like that you just buy shares in in a mutual fund and the mutual fund aggregates uh, money from lots of uh, small investors and then they have a big pool of money that they can say well we're gonna buy you know another 40,000 shares of Apple and they have a manager at the top who's making decisions about that and there's a lot to know about mutual funds but that's sort of a uh, all we're doing is it's pooled it's mutual right so uh, and everybody has uh, you know, divided into shares and you can buy however many you want that would also include real estate investment trusts uh, in that category exchange traded funds these are like mutual funds only rather than calling someone on the phone and buying a share, these uh, shares and these things are traded on exchanges, which means you can get in and out of them very quickly uh, and um, uh, really low cost. And ultimately, I think these are going to win. But nonetheless, uh, you know, certainly grown in prominence over the last, uh, well, gone, come from nothing to prominence in 15 years. Asset-backed securities, these are uh, securities that do not have a specific backer. Rather, they are a collection of receivables, so it could be mortgages or it could be credit card receivables, something like that. We put them into a big bucket, and uh, then we sell undivided interest against that. So uh, we'll spend some time talking about asset-backed securities uh, at other points in the curriculum. But um, uh, basically, we're taking lots of little receivables. We're going to pull them up until we have a billion dollars worth of them, and then we're going to sell securities that entitle you to receive some of the money that those uh, little receivables generate. And then finally down here, hedge funds. If you know what a hedge fund is, you've got one on me. Uh, it seems like uh, everybody wants to call themselves a hedge fund these days. But the idea is that this is a pool of money that's going to be uh, very actively managed and very nimble, right? So they're not uh, subject to normal reporting requirements and uh, they, can, uh, they can strike quickly and uh, they're looking to exploit uh, uh, inefficiencies in the market and mispricing and those types of things. I've heard them described as a, a vacuum cleaner that run, runs around the world picking up nickels, right? So anyway, hedge funds. So I think uh, uh, we'll, we'll get to see more on hedge funds later. Uh, they're difficult to understand uh, or difficult to gauge their success as an asset class, okay? Although uh, certainly there's been some spe spectacular successes in the hedge fund industry. So uh, others, uh, other types of assets, uh, currencies, so you can have dollars, you can have yen, you can have euros. Contracts, this is basically stuff we're going to talk about in the derivatives material, so forwards, futures. These are the same thing, only one of them is exchange traded, that would be futures, and the other is over the counter. Swaps, uh, these are contracts to exchange a series of payments through time. Options, you probably know what that is, the right but not the obligation to buy something or to sell something in the future. And then also insurance is a contract. So commodities, this is going to be uh, you know, wheat, gold, uh, you know, the, the physical inputs uh, in, the, uh, in the real economy. And then real assets we've already talked about. That's going to be, uh, well, real estate would be a great example. Uh, but uh, we might expand that to be you know, machines, railroad rolling stock, that type of stuff. Right? Okay, so what about uh, financial intermediary roles? Okay, well, if we're talking about brokers or exchanges, these are, these are entities or uh, individuals that are going to connect buyers and sellers at the same time. So if you think about a real estate broker. Okay, well, they you know, find somebody wants to sell a house, somebody wants to buy a house, they bring them together, and boom, there's a transaction. So the broker never has a stake in the underlying asset. So they bring people together at the same time and facilitate a trade. A dealer, on the other hand, is someone who matches buyers and sellers uh, at different points in time. So a dealer will maintain an inventory. They'll buy some, uh, some of the asset, and then when the need arises, they will sell the asset, right? So the broker is going to make a commission. The dealer is going to, there's going to be one price they buy at, or the other they sell at. We call that the bid-ask spread, uh, and we'll talk about that later. But uh, this is going to be facilitating transactions between buyers and sellers, but at different points in time. An arbitrageur, okay, that's somebody who tries to... Uh, 
capture arbitrage profits. In its purest sense, uh, this is where you have uh, buyers and sellers of the same security uh, at the same time, but in different markets. So if you had, you know, an, an asset selling for, you know, $5 in uh, one market and then, you know, $8 in another, well, what do you do? Well, you're going to buy and then simultaneously sell, buy for five, sell for eight, and you've just made an arbitrage profit of $3. So arbitrageurs are trying to buy and sell at the same time, but in different markets. So brokers, dealers, and then these arbitrageurs, uh, having a handle on the, the different positions there, I think, are, would be uh, wise. What about uh, the role of financial intermediaries? So we can think of uh, securitizers and in some sense depository institutions such as banks. They're going to sell interest in a diversified pool of assets. So again, this is going to be where we you know, take a bucket of money, right? Uh, we put in a bunch of little assets in here, and then we're going to sell securities against it. So there's going to be a lot of money in this bucket. So uh, if we don't want to spend a lot of time here, but if you wanted to uh, take a billion dollars worth of uh, Sears credit card receivables, right? Well, we could put a billion dollars in there, and then we would say, well, let's sell securities uh, out of that. That is the securitization process. So any one set of receivables from a borrower at uh, the shops at Sears, uh, that's way too small to deal with in the financial markets. But if we put a billion dollars of those things together, well, now we've, you've got our attention, right? So you can sell securities based on the cash flows that come into those receivables. So insurance companies, they're going to manage a diversified pool of risks. So uh, you know, this is the insurance companies you know about, auto insurance, life insurance, those types of things. Uh, they, they think they understand risks, and for the most part they do. Uh, uh, well, they understand risks. They misestimate the, those risks on occasion. So anyway, uh, so what they're going to do is say, look, uh, if we get uh, 1,000 people and we put them in a pool, uh, we know that uh, you know, about X number of them are going to die. So if we sell life insurance and collect premiums uh, in a certain way, then we're going to be able to pay out the premiums to those who do die. We don't know which ones they're going to be, but we know about the number. Uh, and uh, then we can, we can effectively... Uh, make the payments to on the claims, and then still return a profit, right? It's what insurance companies do. And for us, we're the ones buying insurance. We're effectively truncating part of the distribution. We don't want to have any of these bad outcomes. So you insure your house against a fire. Well, if your house burns down, that has lots of bad implications for you. But if you buy fire insurance, homeowner's insurance, then you are you know, limiting your downside risk there. Uh, clearing houses, this is, there are people that are going to, or entities that are going to reduce counterparty risk. So if you buy a security, uh, the, uh, the, you have to have somebody facilitate the, the actual exchange. So uh, the actual transfer of the security from one to the other, well, that's what a clearinghouse does. So if you buy a share of stock, well, someone's got to get the share of stock from you or get from whoever you bought it from, uh, get money from you, and then give you the stock and give them the money. So uh, we don't want to have, you know, we wouldn't want the counterparties to always have to meet up in Kansas City or something in order to make the trade. Uh, investor positions, uh, long, short. Uh, so a long position is um, what we normally think of as buying. Okay? So when we get to the derivative stuff, that uh, gets a little va more vague. But if you buy something, what do you want to have happen to its value? Okay? Well, if I buy a piece of real estate, I want it to go up in value. right? So if I go long real estate, Okay, so I go and buy real estate. I want it to go up in value. So generally, okay, the long position is going to gain when asset values increase, right? as opposed to a short position. And we're going to investigate this a little bit uh, in more detail, what short selling means in a minute. Uh, but a short position, this is a, the, the, this is a position that will gain when asset values decrease. Right? So a long position wins when the value goes up. A short position wins when the value goes down. And you can see how we could write contracts where we would offset those two things, right? So we, you know, we could take a bet on uh, the direction of change in the price of wheat. So if I'm long in a contract, I win if the price of wheat goes up. You're long in the con you're short in the contract. You win when the price of wheat goes down. Well, we would have, a, you know, that would be essentially uh, a, a forward contract on wheat. Okay. Also, financial leverage implies that we can, we don't have to have all of the money required to buy an asset if we're doing a long position. We can borrow part of the purchase price uh, and then, you know, uh, and then uh, pay it back when we sell the asset. Uh, so uh, we can post, uh, you know, post some sort of 
bond, if you want to think of it that way, to, to make sure that we comply with all the rules and that we can sustain losses and that type of stuff. But it allows us to lever up. So we're borrowing part of the purchase price here uh, when we are levering a position. Okay, let's talk, go back and talk about the short selling thing. So uh, lots of people are uh, uncomfortable with the idea of short selling because uh, it seems, uh, I don't know, it seems wrong to people for some reason I've never understood. Anyway, short selling, if we're, if we're going to take a long position, what we want to do is we want to buy low and sell high, right? Uh, I always get that mixed up and do it the opposite. But anyway, you want to buy low and sell high. I know I just checked my notes, all right? So um, that would say, okay, I want to go buy an asset. I think this, I'm bullish on this asset. I think it's going to go up in value. I buy the asset today for 10. It goes up to 15. I sell the asset. I make $5, right? But uh, you can also benefit if you are bearish on an asset. That is, if you think the value, it's overvalued and it's going to go down in price, right? So what we're going to do here, if we think of it in terms of a, uh, of a stock transaction, so the investor can go and borrow a share of stock, right? So you don't worry about where you get it. And there are sometimes fees associated with this, but let's not worry about that at the moment. So uh, you go and you borrow a share of stock and then you sell it in the marketplace. So I borrow the share of stock and I sell it for 15 because I think it's overvalued. At some point in the future, I'm going to have to buy it back okay, and then return it in kind to whoever I borrowed it from. right? So I'm going to borrow it today. I'm going to sell it for 15. If I'm right, its value is going to go down to 10. When I sell it at 15, I bring in $15. When I buy it back at 10, I use 10 of that $15. I repay the uh, loan in kind, and I end up with my profit, right? So a short sell, okay, there's some special rules. Uh, so if I borrow a share of stock, somebody owns it over there, I borrow it from him, sell it over here. Now there's two people that think they own the, sh the same share of stock. Well, if the company pays a dividend while I've got a, the short position on, okay, then they're going to pay a dividend to one of us, but they're not going to pay two dividends just because I thought their stock was overvalued, right? So I would have to pay any dividends. I would also have to put up some collateral to make sure I could sustain losses if I were wrong. I sold it at 15 and it goes up to 150, right? But what I'm basically doing is I'm still going to buy low and sell high. I'm just going to do it in reverse order, right? I'm going to sell when the security is high and then I'm going to wait uh, for the rest of the world to get as smart as me and the value goes down and I'm going to buy it back at a lower price. So short selling, uh, if you are Andy Holmes, then that's hard to do. The fees are high, all that sort of stuff. But if you're Goldman Sachs, then uh, shorting is not... Uh, particularly difficult in many markets, right? So what about buying stock on margin, right? So this just says we're going to buy a stock. It costs $100 uh, for a share, and uh, we're going to borrow a portion of the purchase price. The broker is going to hold the stock as collateral. So we're going to put up some money. The broker is going to arrange for a loan okay, uh, for the rest of it, but then the broker is going to hold the stock as collateral for that loan. So we have an equity position, and we've levered it via this margin trade. So there's two types of margin here. There's initial margin. That's the minimum equity position at the time of purchase. So equity requirements or margin requirements in the United States are generally 50%, which I've always thought I wish they'd do it 45 or 55, just so uh, people wouldn't get confused. Well, is that the amount I'm borrowing, or is that the amount I'm putting up? And the answer, of course, is yes, if it's 50%. But margin, the mi margin is the amount that you put up. So if we did this on 40% margin for a $100 stock and we were going to buy one share, we would put up $40 and get a loan for $60, right? But margins require, margin requirements are 50%, so we're going to put up 50 bucks and then get a loan for 50 But what happens if we buy this $100 stock and, you know, we've got a $50 loan and $50 of equity and the stock price starts falling, right? Well, at some point, the broker gets nervous, right? You don't want you know, brokers loans you $50, uh, and he doesn't want to have the value of the stock. He doesn't want to be holding the stock if the value goes down to $20, because then you, know, you, may not, uh, you may default on the loan. So there's also a maintenance margin requirement, and that's the minimum equity position that you can have in the trade uh, while, while you have the margin account, right? So the equity percentage is just going to be the stock value minus the loan divided by the stock value. So when you first did it, uh, first bought it, it was $100. In my little example, minus a $50 loan divided by, uh, uh, divided by $100, so you had 50% margin. But what if the stock price dwindles to, uh, you know, 75, right? Well, then we're going to have 75 minus 50, 
uh, over 75. So now, instead of having 50% margin, we're only going to have 33% margin, right? So anyway, so margin is falling because the loan size doesn't shrink. You, you borrow $50, dollars you got to pay back $50 dollars but the overall size of the position does, so that's the uh, bad thing about leverage, right? Uh, it makes, uh, makes the good times better, the bad times worse, so if the stock goes up, you really make a lot of money in, in percentage terms, but if the stock goes down, you lose money fast as well. So uh, let's try an example real quick, so uh, return on a margin position. Uh, so we're going to have an investor who's going to buy 1,000 shares of stock on 50% margin at $60 a share. The uh, margin loan rate is going to be 2% per year. The stock is going to pay an annual dividend of $40 per share. So if I buy the stock, I get the dividend, right? So this isn't a, this isn't a short sell. I'm just going to go and buy some shares, and I'm getting a loan to do it, right? So uh, the stock is going to pay um, you know, 1,000 shares, 40, 40 cents, so I'm going to get a $400 dividend. The commission is going to be 1% to buy, and then, excuse me, 1 cent to buy each share, and then 1 cent to sell each share. So uh, one year later, so all this is going to be happening at time zero. That's the initiation of the trade. And then one year later, I'm going to sell the stock for 66 bucks. What's the leverage ratio and what's the return on the margin position? Okay. Well, we got to think about how much we invested and what we get back when we sell, all those types of things in order to get the return. So the leverage ratio is just one over the initial margin. So that says we have a leverage ratio of two. If we could ignore, you know, trading costs and, you know, interest and all that sort of stuff, what that would say is we could take the return on the asset, okay, and multiply it by two. So the return on the asset, the asset goes from, uh, uh, from $60 to uh, $66, so we get a 10% increase in the value of the asset. Well, we would have a 20% return. So the R return on the asset position overall times the leverage ratio would tell us uh, what our return on our equity investment or our actual cash investment, if you want to think of it that way, would be. Now, all the trading costs and all that sort of stuff is going to make it so that the real return is not going to be simply ROA times the leverage ratio. Okay, so what's going to happen to our, in our little example? Well, let's see. The equity investor is going to put up half of the money because he's uh, borrowing the other half times $60. So for every share he buys, he's going to put up $30 times 1,000 shares, so we're going to sink, sink $30,000 into this. We're going to borrow the other $30,000. we are also going to have $10 in commission, one penny times 1,000 shares. So at time zero, that's what we're going to write a check for. So that's our all-in investment of $30,010. And what we're going to do is say, well, all right, if I want to know what my return is, I'm going to have you know, whatever I get back, and I'm going to divide it by $30,010 to see uh, what sort of return I made on my investment. So what am I going to get back? Hey, well, the dividends are going to be $400, so that's coming into me. The interest on the loan, that's going out. So I borrowed $30,000. I put up $30,000, borrowed $30,000, 2%, so I have to pay $600 in interest. The sales proceeds, I sell for $66, 1,000 shares, so that's $66,000 coming in. But remember, I've got, uh, uh, I have to pay the sales commission, okay, $10, uh, $10 there. But I don't get to keep this whole $66,000, right? So, I mean, I own the stock, but, but I had borrowed to do that. So I've got to repay the loan. So I've got $66,000 that came into me when I sold. I have $400 in dividends. I have to repay my loan and repay the interest and pay the commission to uh, unwind the trade there. So at the end of the day, what I'm going to get back is going to be $35,790. What's my return? Well, I'm going to take that, uh, so this is like a, you know, a P1 over P0 minus 1, right? So a holding period return. So I invested $30,010. I get back $35,790, and my return here is going to be 19.26%. So uh, the leverage ratio was 2. The return on the asset was 10%. But all of the interest and, you know, transactions costs and all that sort of stuff, we didn't have a return of 20%. We had a return of 19.26% because of the, the transactions cost involved in this trade. All right? So, uh, so you ought to be able to think through that, very basic calculations. Uh, and when we talk about net proceeds from sale, remember, it's the $10 that we paid to get out of the trade. The other $10 is going to be a time zero cash flow. We had to put that in, so uh, that's going to be treated like it's part of the initial investment.
All right, so margin call. Well, here's the problem with buying on margin. Uh, well, one, if the, value, if the values fall, then the leverage ratio works both ways. You have a 5% return on assets, you can multiply it by two. If you have a minus 5% return on assets, you also have to multiply that by two, right? But if, you have the, if the value of the asset falls far enough, you're going to get a margin call, okay? And a margin call says that your equity in the position is now less than the maintenance margin. So you either have to bring in some more cash because okay, the broker is getting nervous, you either have to bring in some more cash or uh, marginable securities, or the broker is going to sell your uh, stock because uh, they they can't they don't want the credit risk on the loan. So the trigger price okay, is going to be the uh, um, the initial price uh, at which we bought the stock times this fu this function one over the initial margin divided by one not one over, one minus the initial margin over one minus the maintenance margin. You could also just go back and think about, well, what is the, when is it that I only have the maintenance margin left in terms of equity? Uh, but this is a little formula you can throw on a formula sheet. So an investor buys a stock on margin at a price of 70. Okay, the initial margin requirements are 40 and the maintenance margin is 25. At what price will they receive a margin call? Okay, well, 70 is the initial price, one minus the initial over one minus the maintenance. Okay, multiply by that ratio. If the, if the stock falls below $56, okay, then uh, so uh, $55.99, I guess, then you're going to end up getting a margin call. The broker is going to call you and say, hey, you've got to bring in some more money to bring this up to 25% uh, margin or else we have to close out your position. All right? So um, uh, I would I'd make sure I threw that on my formula sheet uh, when I was preparing for the exam. Okay, trading instructions. So uh, we can talk about the execution. That is how to trade. So there are market orders which uh, say, okay, I want to buy this stock. I'm issuing them, or I'm going to enter a market order when, uh, uh, and that a market order is going to be filled at the best available price when we're filling the order. So now that's really, really quick. Uh, but you know, it used to be you had to go down to the exchange floor and get over to the trading pit, and there's still a few things that will happen like that. But it just says I want to buy, and I want to buy at whatever the market price is. And the trouble with that is, of course, you don't know what's going to happen to the market price between the time you hit send and the order is executed, right? The price could go way up or the price could go way down in that time. Okay, a limit order says to buy or, uh, or to execute a transaction at a specific price or better, right? So if you, have a, if you have a stock that's trading at 22, you want to buy it at, so when you buy, a better price is lower. When you sell, a better price is higher, right? So uh, you could, if you find the stock's trading at 22, you could enter a limit order at 20, Okay, limit order to buy at 20, and then if the price goes down to 20 or below, that order would be executed. So if you think there's variability you can take advantage of, well, then that would be one way to you know, try to hit uh, the low point in the market for the day or something like that. The validity, and we're going to come back and talk about those again. Uh, the validity, that's when to trade, so it can be an order that's good until canceled. So that just says keep this on the books, and if it ever hits that limit, then you can execute. An immediate or cancel, either do it or it's dead. Or a day order just says you've got the rest of the day to fill this, and uh, if, you, uh, if you can't fill it during the day, then it dies. Okay? A stop order okay, it executes if a specific price level is reached. So we'll talk about stop orders again, but uh, if you write in the word here loss, okay, so these are sometimes called stop loss orders. Okay, well, what that says is you're going to have, you're going to have instructions to buy or sell, uh, and you're going to specify a stop price. And if, it, if there's ever a trade at the stop price, then this is going to be converted into a market order. So if, it, if you had a stop, if you had a, uh, a stop loss to uh, sell at 20, right, uh, and the price drops down, not stop loss to buy at 20 is what I meant, sorry, stop loss to buy at 20, and it drops down to 20, it kisses 20 for one trade and then comes back up, well, you're still going to then be executed because, uh, or the, the you won't be executed. The trade will be executed uh, because uh, the stop price was hit. Right? So a stop order becomes a market order when the stop price is hit. A limit order will only execute at the limit price or better. Right? And we'll, we're going to talk about those again. So order execution. Okay, so the uh, dealer buys at the bid and sells at the ask. So this is the famous bid-ask spread. Right? So, uh, so you can think of this as if you've ever traded a car, 
Then you go down, you uh, give the dealer your old car, he gives you $11,000 for it, and then you drive past the lot three days later and he's asking $16,000. Okay, well, the bid is what he's going to buy at. Okay, the ask is what he'll sell at. So the bid-ask spread is the dealer's profit. Uh, and, of course, uh, uh, the smaller the bid-ask spread, the better for you as an investor or trader. And also that's a, a great indicator of the efficiency or depth of that particular market, right? So the best bid, that's the highest price that, uh, that's the, of the dealers out there, that's whoever has the highest price is the best bid. The best offer, that's the lowest ask. So if we talk about the best bid, um, the, uh, the best bid and the best offer, okay, that makes the market. That determines what the bid-ask spread is. And if you enter a market order, then you are said to take the market. So you're going to be trading with those best bid or best, app, best offer. All right, so anyway, so, um, uh, so that's uh, the idea of the bid-ask spread. And this actually becomes a really important concept in a lot of financial theory. Uh, and you're going to see that a number of times as you progress through the, through the curriculum. So you want to understand what a bid-ask spread is. Okay, types of orders. We already mentioned this, but it's a real quick, uh, uh, or maybe a little more in-depth uh, re review here. So looking at a market order. So a market order, okay, this is going to immediately execute at the best available price when it hits uh, whatever the market is. So it's useful if you're trading based on information. So you think, hey, I found out, there are I don't know, I'm trying to think of something that's not information, that's not inside information. So something you could trade on uh, and still be of good moral character. Uh, but you think that uh, this is going to go, uh, it's good, stock's going to go up because uh, you've uh, somehow decided there's going to be a merger. Well, you don't want to mess around with uh, anything else. You want to get the stock. You want to own it as quickly as possible because people are going to find out about this soon. Well, then uh, you issue a market order. A limit order, okay, so you can buy at a limit price or lower. So the limit order is to execute it at uh, the limit price or better. So buying means buying at lower price. Selling means uh, selling at a higher price. So if you want to uh, buy some stock, it's trading at 22 you're not an information trader. You don't feel like you have to get into this, but you're going to put it in your portfolio, and you do it especially if you could get it at 20. So you put in a limit order to buy at 20, and uh, you know if the stock uh, drips, drops down to 1975, your trade's going to be executed, and maybe you're trying to take advantage of sort of you know random volatility or changes in the market, something along those lines. Now, the, so it avoids uh, uncertainty about the about the execution price, right? But also, if the stock doesn't ever go down to 20, then your order's never going to be executed, right? So, um, uh, so it, uh, you may not ever get your order filled if you fill a, put in a limit order. A stop loss order, this is a, tra uh, a trade, a trade in this exchange at the stop or trigger price activates a market order. So if you have a, trailer, a trader who owns a stock that's currently trading at 35, they might have a stop sell order at 31.50. So if you own it, okay, and you think uh, you're worried about losses, a stop loss, stop me from having any more losses order, right? So you own it at 35, well, if it goes down to 31.50, you think it's heading south and you want to get out. So once, that, once there is any trade in the market at 31.50, that becomes a market order, even if it jumps back up to uh, $40, right? So you have a stop sell at $31.50. Well, if the price never goes down to $31.50, then that's never going to be executed. But if there's one trade at $31.50, then it's going to become a market order. You could also have a trader who's short uh, a stock. It's trading at $35. And you're saying, well, look, I think it's going to go down. But if it starts heading north, it starts going up, I want to get out of this thing. So you could have a stop buy at $39. So uh, if it ever hits 39, then uh, it's going uh, it's to become a market order. And you might even have a technician who thinks that, uh, that means a technical trader, who thinks if you have a trade on a certain security above 60, that means that there's this uh, upward trend that he wants to, or she wants to capitalize on. So you could have a stop buy at 60. Uh, and if it hits 60, then it's going to be executed, right? So stop loss orders, limit orders, market orders, you want to make sure you know what's happening with that. Okay, primary markets, again, this is where the sale of new issues uh, of stocks or bonds are going to come out. This is where if we talk about IPOs or seasoned equity offerings, this is where it's going to happen. Uh, so the proceeds, less uh, the Ferraris for the investment bankers, are going to accrue to the issuer. Secondary market, that's where investors trade it. So NYSE, OTC, NASDAQ, you know, all that type of stuff. Uh, this is just trades between investors. And of course, the secondary market is really important to the primary market because 
Liquidity, the secondary market is what provides liquidity to the assets that, you, that get sold in the primary market. And liquidity can be, you know, 30 or 40 or 50 percent of the value of a security. So uh, the more active the secondary market, the better the primary uh, capital market prices are going to be. So secondary markets provide liquidity and also information uh, that uh, is going to be important to investors. So primary markets, if you want to, you're, you're living the American dream, you start a company, it's grown to the point where you think you can take it public, well, then you're going to uh, you know, hire an investment banker and they're going to help facilitate the sale of this equity to, uh, to the public. Well, there's a couple of ways we can do that. We can do it with an underwritten offer. That's where the, bank, the investment bank says, okay, I'm going to buy the whole thing. And then I'm going to use my channels to distribute it. Uh, and if it doesn't all sell, well, I'm on the line for it. I'm going to buy the whole thing. You don't have any uncertainty, Mr. Entrepreneur. Okay? There's also a best efforts basis, which the investment bank says, OK, I'm going to take the issue, and I'm going to do my best, I'm going to, do my best to push this through my channels and sell all of it. Okay? But if it doesn't all sell, I'm not going to be responsible. Okay? I'll just give that back to you. So a best efforts versus an underwritten offer. You can also have a private placement, which just says, hey, we're going to sell this to qualified investors and we're not going to have a big fanfare, go to the exchange. Uh, we're just going to sell this and you know, sell it privately. A shelf registration, this is uh, where we uh, can register an a, a security issuance with the regulatory authorities, but we don't sell it right away. We put it on the shelf, shelf registration, and then we sell it as uh, opportunity arises through time. Okay, a dividend reinvestment plan, this is uh, usually... a uh, uh, sponsored by uh, an issuer. So if you uh, own shares in um, GM and they pay a dividend, then you can say, well, instead of sending me those little dividend checks, I don't want that, just give me some more stock. So they will just issue stock to you in exchange for keeping the dividend, and uh, that would be a dividend reinvestment plan. And then finally, a rights offering down here. A rights offering is just going to be where they're going to sell shares to the current shareholders and giving them essentially the opportunity to maintain a, per, a percentage ownership in the firm. So if you own a thousand shares, you can, you can buy three more shares because we were going to sell it to the public. And if you don't buy it, your position is going to be uh, diluted. So a rights offering, this is where we're going to sell to current shareholders. Okay, market structures. So a quote-driven market, this is where investors trade with dealers as opposed to an order-driven market, order-driven market where uh, we're going to have rules about how buyers and sellers gets, get matched, right? So a quote-driven market, you're dealing with a dealer. You can also have brokered markets. Those are usually for thinner traded, more thinly traded assets or something that makes them hard to push through uh, a normal market slash exchange. But uh, that's where the broker is going to find a counterparty, right? So if you've got a big block of uh, Apple stock you want to get rid of, then uh, you could go and go through a normal, uh, would probably be an order-driven market for Apple. Uh, but uh, you could also just hire a broker and say, look, uh, as you get the opportunity over the next couple of months, I want to unload this, uh, but I don't want to have the price impact of having this big, this big block go through all at once. So that would be brokered markets. Um, call versus continuing mar continuous markets. Again, a call market. This is where we accumulate bid, uh, uh, bids and offers, right? So we're all the buyers and sellers, uh, we're going to bring them all and get to where we have a big stack of each. And uh, then we're going to uh, clear the market all at one point in time. So this is generally used in smaller markets, sometimes very small markets, like you got an overhead projector and you got four securities in some little country somewhere. Uh, and it's also sometimes used to open major markets. You accumulate uh, orders overnight, you clear them, that would be the call. And then it moves into a continuous environment, which is where Buyers and sellers are just uh, interacting during the day uh, anytime the market or the exchange is open. All right? So call versus continuous markets. And uh, for most of what you're going to think about, you're going to be thinking in terms of continuous markets. Okay, A, a well-functioning financial system. Okay, a well-functioning financial system has several attributes. Okay, one of those is completeness. There's you know, sufficient assets and contracts so that whatever your hypothesis is about the direction of change in securities or the macro economy or whatever it is, there's a way for you to take advantage of that. So we have a complete set. We can, uh, we can uh, buy and sell and short and all that sort of stuff so that we can benefit from whatever our understanding or whatever our uh, uh, conception, conceptualization is of what's going to happen in the future. Okay, operational efficiency. This is where we have, you know, both uh, quick and low cost transactions. So operational efficiency, uh, there's certainly been a dramatic uh, increase in operational efficiency over the course of my life. So uh, I'm now 32. Um, 
No, I'm kidding. Anyway, I got shoes that are 32 years old. Uh, so, um, uh, but uh, back in the old days when we were in, you know, had to, you know, actually put on shoes and go down to the exchange floor and trade a security, as opposed to now where we can, you know, zip stuff around the around the globe with electronic transactions so quickly. Operational efficiency definitely enhanced and always, I suppose, an issue. However, right, we're going to spend time in the curriculum talking about. Uh, market efficiency okay and when we do that what we're talking about is this one okay it's not operational efficiency we can always we can always hope for more operationally efficient markets but what we're really interested in is our markets informationally efficient which is to say does the price of a security reflect its fundamental value another way to say that was or is does the price of a security reflect the currently available information Right? So is the information already impounded into the value of that security? So this is going to be a big deal. Uh, we'll talk about it in another reading, but uh, nonetheless, this is, when we say efficiency, we're not really talking about operational. It's important, uh, but that's not where the controversy lies. It's in information. Uh, and of course, the financial intermediaries are going to uh, be there to facilitate transactions, uh, and that's going to be part of the operational aspect of it. Okay, what about the objectives of market regulation? Uh, to finish things off here, so we want to make sure when we, we have market regulation and we probably want some degree of market regulation and we want to do things like protect unsophisticated investors so we got things like you know qualified investors can do things that uh, other investors can't uh, we've got rules for competency and uh, and such for the people that work in the markets so some sort of minimum uh, require minimum standards of competency you've got to get uh, you know your Series 7 exam or whatever that might be. Uh, we want to prevent trading on inside information, so uh, that's going to be disruptive to the markets. We want to require common financial reporting standards so we can compare one entity to another, and then probably also have some minimum capital levels for different types of institutions, uh, just so we don't see uh, you know, disruption in the financial markets because we had uh, institutions that were too thinly capitalized and, you know, little market blips ended up throwing them over the edge, right? Okay, so uh, if you are not, uh, uh, if you don't have a long history of working in uh, the, uh, the capital markets, then there is good information here and stuff that you definitely need to know. And if you have been around for a while, so around the markets for a while, then this is a good review. Those things that you didn't know, you probably are going to need to because for the rest of the CFA curriculum, we're going to take these concepts and this terminology and just say, oh, well, the bid-ask spread is this, or this is the way we think of efficiency, or, you know, we're going to do, we're going to short this security, or those types of things. So you want to make sure that you have a handle on these basics.